Welcome to this new lecture of Detection, Segmentation and Tracking. Today we will cover two-stage object detectors. We already saw in the last lecture that we will talk about two deep learning based types of object detectors, the one-stage detectors and the two-stage detectors. In the one-stage detectors, we go directly from image to feature extraction, usually using a convolutional neural network, and then directly towards classification of class scores and localization through bounded box coordinates. The two-stage detectors, on the other hand, divide the whole process of going from image to classes and bounding boxes into two steps. So at first, what they do is they extract a series of regions of interest called object proposals. And then the classification and the localization happens only on these object proposals. So it's like first looking at all the image, then extracting interesting regions, and then further analyzing only these interesting regions. And as we will see, the two-stage detectors are very powerful and lead to a really high accuracy. We will start by looking at the localization. So how do we actually localize these objects inside the image? Let's assume that we have this image that um, contains only one object, this penguin, and we actually want to find the object in the image. We want to find the exact bounding box that englobes the position of this penguin. Now, we have already talked about the representation of a bounding box, and these will be represented by box coordinates, usually X and Y, which represent the bottom left part or the bottom left coordinates of uh, the bounding box, and then the width and height of this bounding box. So, of course, these coordinates can be um, extracted through regression, right? So, so we have to map um, from image to um, coordinates with a neural network. And usually this neural network is going to be a CNN. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to train um, our network for regression with the ground truth bounding box coordinates. And simply how we can do this is by using an L2 loss function. Now, as I said, usually this feature extraction happens with a convolutional neural network because we want to extract these features from an image and we know the power of convolutional neural networks to do that. But then uh, we have to actually take one step further to go from um, the CNN output to the bounding box coordinates. And this usually happens with uh, one or two fully connected layers. Um, so we can do this directly for this image where we have only one object and we need to output only one set of box coordinates. And at the same time, another thing that we could do is have another set of fully connected layers that actually predicts the class scores for the object that is found on this image. So again, this is only for one object that is found in the image, the first um, head with fully connected layers actually outputs the bounding box coordinates. The second head classifies this object and says, for example, this image contains a penguin. The bounding box coordinates can be trained with an L2 loss. As I've said, the class scores can be trained with a classic softmax loss. And you will see this division into what is called a regression head and a classification head very, very often in most of the detectors that we would talk about. And usually the regression head refers to the regression of bounding box coordinates and the classification head actually refers to the semantic class of the objects that are being detected. So before um, all the new object detectors that we will present in this lecture were actually introduced, it was really typical to train these um, two heads separately. So for example, one would train the classification head first, then freeze those layers, then train the regression head and iterate. So of course, at test time, one would want to use both. But at that time, it was hard to know how to train two heads at the same time. So the easy solution was to train one first and then the other. Nowadays, of course, 
We train neural networks with multiple heads all at the same time and just um, balancing the different losses. So this leads us to the first method um, that I want to discuss in the two-stage object uh, detector lecture. And this is the overfit, which is kind of the first method that proposed to use a sliding window a type of approach for object detection plus a box regression, a regression head and a classification head. And they actually wanted to do this in an end-to-end -end fashion. So going directly from image to bounding box coordinates and class scores. So what they actually proposed was to use this convolutional neural network to extract a feature map, which will still keep some sort of spatial resolution. So you see that the feature map has depth 1024, but still maintains a width of 5 by 5. So there is some um, notion of a spatial location still in that feature map. And then it would um, learn to classify these 1000 classes, for example, and it would also output the bounding box coordinates for each of these 1000 classes. Of course, if you had no penguin in the image, you might still have a bounding box but then the class score for penguin will be very low. So you will assume that there is no penguin in the image. Now I want to discuss a little bit further the concept of sliding window. So we saw already the concept for, um, let's say, pre-deep learning detectors and how they use sliding window to actually detect objects in images. And it turns out that this idea is very much used in deep learning also, and it's implicitly encoded in the structure of a CNN. So how the sliding window works is you just slide the box in the different locations of the image. As soon as you hit the target, for example, this penguin here, you would get a really high output for the classification of the class penguin. And so you would keep this box. Of course, there are other boxes that depict this penguin and they're actually located in slightly different um, parts of the image. So what you basically end up with is different predictions and you actually have to combine all of them to create one final detection. So we already discussed how non-maximum suppression uh, was used and how it, it is still used in current object detectors. Now, overfit, um, they have a slightly different method, and you can actually read about the greedy method they have. But essentially, it's the same idea. You have three detections coming out from this sliding window plus regression plus classification approach, and you have to choose one of them because you know there are no three penguins in this image. So in practice, what Overfit proposes is to use many sliding window locations and to use also multiple scales. So to actually process the image at multiple scales so that you can better detect small objects and big objects at the same time. So with this um, type of approach, now we can detect objects, we can classify them, and we can do this all in an end-to-end -end fashion by inputting simply the image to our neural network and having us output the boxes and the class scores. Another question is, um, you see here roughly the, the sketch of the architecture, right? It's not very detailed, but you can see that um, this orange neural network is a convolutional neural network. Um, the blue-green bars are fully connected layers. So now the question is, what prevents us from dealing with any image size? Or I could also say, can we actually input an image that is not 221 by 221, but 600 by 400 by 3, and still be able to detect penguins and classify them in this, uh, with this architecture? So you can think about this. You can pause the video for a second and then move on once you have an idea of what the solution might be. So what prevents us really from dealing with any image size are the fully connected layers, right? The fully connected layers expect a fixed size as input, 
And of course, if we have a larger image, our feature map is no longer going to be 5 by 5 by 1024, but might be 10 by 10 by 1024, which means that the fully connected layers are not going to work with this new feature map. But what happens actually when you have multiple objects, right? So I know that I can do localization by regression. I've shown this, I've seen this in these past slides. But what about the actual detection? So the question is, um, if you not only have one object where you know I need to have four coordinates as an output, but now suddenly you have three objects. So you could say, well, if I have three objects, instead of having uh, an output of size 4, I'm now going to have an output of size 12. So I simply have four um, numbers per each of the objects that I want to detect. But of course, you don't know a priori how many objects are in the image. Could be that there are four, could be that there are 14, and suddenly you need to have a number uh, of output. Um, you need to have your output, which actually contains 56 numbers, so 14 objects multiplied by 4. So in general, it is a problem to have this variable sized output. And this is definitely not optimal for neural networks. There are workarounds um, for, this, for this problem. One is using recurrent neural networks, and the other is uh, work that goes towards set prediction instead of a fixed tensor prediction. But we will not talk about this. Today, we will talk about another way of actually doing detection. So instead of doing regression and wanting to predict directly the bounding box coordinates, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow more of a classification approach. So if I think again about the sliding window, and I put this box on top of my image, this red rectangle, I can actually analyze the pixels inside the box and answer the question, is this a flamingo? I answer the question, this is no, so I ignore this box. I do the same with another box until I have a box that actually hits the position of a flamingo and I obtain a classification result, yes, this is a flamingo. So it turns out that you can do localization with regression and you can do detection with classification. But of course, here you can already see the problem, right? So it's really expensive to try all possible positions for the bounding box, plus all possible scales and all possible aspect ratios. So we have, if we have to do this brute force, this is going to be incredibly expensive. So the idea, again, goes back to the object proposal that we presented in the last lecture is how about we try only on an interesting subset of boxes. So I want to first analyze the image, extract this subset of boxes that I deem, you know, as having a high potential for containing an object, and then performing classification and regression only on those bounding boxes. And this is exactly uh, what two-stage detectors do. So they first extract region proposals, these regions of interest. And we have already seen in the last lecture methods that actually give you these interesting regions. So you have all these boxes um, that are lying around with different aspect ratios, uh, with different scales, and that potentially contain an object. And so once you obtain these region proposals, what you can simply do is classify them. Is there a dog in this bounding box? Is there a flamingo in this bounding box? And so this is kind of the principle um, for um, the now famous RCNN family of object detectors. So the R stands for um, region and then uh, convolutional neural networks. And all the um, members of this family, RCNN detector, faster CNN, faster CNN, are based on this two-stage idea of first extracting regions of interest and then classifying and regressing them. Now, this is a quick overview of how RCNN actually works. So you have your input image. You use an external method to extract region proposals, roughly 2,000. And now, instead of having to analyze the whole image, you just have to analyze these 2,000 regions. And how you do this, actually, is you work them to a fixed size, you pass them through a CNN, and then you make your neural network predict anything you want, classification, regression, etc., etc. So you can judge each of these region proposals and see if they contain persons, airplanes, cats, or dogs. 
So um, how this actually works is through, um, so in, in the case of RCNN, in a very kind of separate way, right? So you have this bounding box that you first extract, these, these object proposals that you first extract, then you work them to this fixed size, and then you apply a convolutional neural network on top. And on top of this convolutional neural network, you have the bounding box regression, and you have a further support vector machine that actually classifies this bounding box into the different semantic classes. So now, why I'm saying is this is a separate um, computation is because if you have overlapping bounding boxes, you will do the confnet computation for each of the pixels two or three times, depending on the overlap. So it's not the fastest of methods. And you can already see why there is a fast RCNN after this. So extracting features is what the confnet does. And it turns out that while regression can be done with fully connected layers, the classification at that point, so we're talking about 2014, was still done with a separate classification head with a separate uh, machine learning algorithm, which was not based on deep learning, but it was actually support vector machine. And uh, the bounding box uh, regression was actually not to fully predict um, the location of the object, but just to refine the bounding box location of the object proposal. So once you have analyzed these object proposals, you can also refine their location so that they tightly fit around the object. So as a training scheme, this was not done, you know, all in all at once, which is what we would do nowadays. Uh, but you would actually separate training into several steps. So first of all, of all comes of course the pre-training of the CNN on ImageNet. So this is a classic for, I would say, almost all computer vision tasks that you actually have a CNN pre-trained on ImageNet. This gives you already good features to analyze images. Then you would fine tune the CNN on the specific number of classes that your detector is actually aiming to classify. And you would do this with a softmax loss. And then what you would do is you would actually train for RCNN, you would train a separate support vector machine classifier to classify these image regions. And in this particular case, you would have one SVM per class and you would use the hinge loss to train that. And finally, separately, you would train the bounding box regressor. So first train um, for classification and then train for regression. Now, of course, um, there are several pros uh, of, this, of this pipeline. And this is that um, the, the current pipeline that they were proposing, which was, first of all, extracting proposal, then extracting features with CNN, and then performing SVM classification on top. These were kind of well-known parts and they were well tested in the field of object detection. So they knew SVM worked really well for classification um, and they knew how to extract good object proposals. So essentially, the only thing that changed in this whole pipeline with respect to classic methods was that now the features were not hog features or some of the features that we saw in the last lecture but they were CNN features. But still the pipeline was separate into proposal, um, into an algorithm that actually gives you proposals, and then a separate SVM that performs classification. So what the CNN would do is it would take its proposal and it would summarize it into this 4096 vector. So it was a much more compact representation compared to Hawk, and it was also a much richer representation. And you would also leverage transfer learning, which we do nowadays, you know, every day for computer vision applications, because the CNN was pre-trained for image classification on C classes, for example, on ImageNet. Now, if you want to train your CNN for, let's say, Z classes, but you still want to leverage what you have learned from ImageNet, the only thing you need to do is change the last of fully connected layers and fine-tune your network. Now, of course, RCNN was kind of a milestone, right? It showed that, that CNNs uh, could do a lot for, um, for object detection, 
But unfortunately, the method was really slow. So it was 47 seconds per image with a VGG16 backbone. And one would need to actually consider 2,000 proposals per image. And these proposals had to be, first of all, extracted, then warped, then forwarded through the CNN. So it was a very um, tedious process. The training was also very slow, was very complex with all the parts coming in together. And another um, disadvantage was that the object proposal algorithm is fixed. So while the feature extraction and the SVM classifier could be trained, um, first of all, they were not trained together. So you're not really exploiting the, the learning paradigm to its full potential. But at the same time, they could not influence the object proposal algorithm. So the object proposal algorithm would never be improved by the training of our CNN. So we can, we can of course, try to solve the, like all the things at the same time, right? But um, let's try to look at the cons one at a time and let's try to solve first um, the problem of this being a slow method. So the question is, can we actually make it faster? So inspiration came from the work SPPNet. So unlike RCNN, which would actually take an image at test time, extract the object proposals, and then put the CNN on top of each of these proposals, the SPPNet, what it would do is would have one convolutional neural network that would be put on top of the image and it would analyze the features of the whole image. Then on top of that, you would actually extract your proposals and compute the features from those. So you can already see that this is a much more efficient way of using neural networks because if you have overlapping object proposals, then you have to extract a bunch of features twice. While in this case, you only have to apply one neural network to a uh, forward, one forward pass, and then you can extract all the features that you want at each location based on the object proposals. Now, the only question that, that SPP heavily focused on was actually how to pull these features into a common size, and they actually propose a method for that. If you're interested in it, you can read this ECCV 2014 paper. And the other thing that SVPNet had was that the neural network that actually extracted the features was frozen. So of course, this is, this is not ideal, right? SVPNet did not solve all the problems of RCNN. It did solve the problem of being slow at test time, but it still had some problems inherited from RCNN, namely that the training was still slow, was a bit faster than RCNN, but it was still very complex. And it was still no end-to-end -end training, right? It still has this, this feature extraction network that uh, was frozen. You actually did not backpropagate through it when you were performing, when you were learning this, this object detection task. So this was kind of um, another um, stone that uh, put together to uh, with RCNN, actually created the version fast RCNN. And how things were made faster in this case was, first of all, by having this shared computation at test time, like SPP, right? So we're not going to have one component placed on top of each proposal, and each uh, of these 2,000 separate components, you would actually need to do 2,000 forward passes. So now there's going to be only one forward pass of the whole image through this component. And then the question is what to do with the features that you get after, for example, um, layer five. So the, this COM5 feature map of the image. So what you would do then is you would get your regions of interest, right? You would get your object proposals and you would put them on top of this feature map. You would extract features only at the locations that you are interested in. But now see that we have before the classifier and the regression, we have a series of fully connected layers. And this means that these fully connected layers actually expect a fixed size as input, which means that from all the object proposals that have different sizes, different aspect ratios, uh, ratios we actually have to convert the feature representations into a fixed size. 
And this is exactly um, this operation, the region of interest pooling, that Faster CNN proposed to actually, in a very simple way, take all these differently sized feature maps and convert them to a very specific size so that the fully connected layers can work on them. So let's see how the region of interest or ROI pooling um, actually works. So we have our image, our penguin image, the convolutional neural network that extracts this feature map and the fully connected layers, the same thing that we had for overfit that are actually predicting our boxes and our class scores. Now what happens is that this feature map has size, for example, L by K by C. Of course, L by K is determined by the input size of the image and by the operations inside the convolutional neural network. But now what happens is that the fully connected layers have actually been trained and have been trained to expect a fixed size of H by W by C. So you can see that the feature map and what the FC layers expect is actually um, not the same. It doesn't have the same dimensions. So if I now further um, have an object proposal, which is of this size, and it corresponds to this part of the feature map, it turns out that what we actually want to fit to the fully connected layers is not the full feature map, right? But it's this small uh, feature map marked by this green box and this feature map can have any size because our object proposal can have any size. But we actually have to forcefully transform this feature map into a size H by W by C so that it can be consumed by the FC layers. So the question is exactly how to do this, right? So I have my feature map, I have the object proposal, the green box on top of it. Now I can zoom in on this uh, region of interest, on this object proposal, and I can say, well, if I actually, uh, if my FC layers expect a fixed size of H by W by C, let's just create this fixed size artificially. So what we do is we put an H by W grid on top of my uh, object proposal feature map. And I basically create through pooling, so simple max pooling, one feature map, which is going to be H by W by C. And how I do this is from this H by W grid, for each location of this grid, I take all the pixels that fall into this location, I compute the maximum, and I pass along this maximum, I basically do max pooling, and I pass along the maximum value to fill in one of the, of the pixel positions of this feature map of H by W by C. So if I now have a bigger region of interest, a bigger uh, object proposal, I will just be pulling more pixels, but I will still have guaranteed output of the feature map of H by W by C. So, okay, I can fix this operation, right? But the question is, can I actually backpropagate through this operation? And it turns out that it's really easy to do backpropagation through this operation because in the end, it's just the max pooling. So the backpropagation works exactly the same as it works for max pooling. So essentially what we do is we pass on the gradient to the maximum location. So, okay, with this modification, it might not seem like a big modification, but it does really increase it increase the speed of uh, faster CNN with respect to our CNN. So the, the speed up at test time, sorry, at training time was actually 8.8 um, .8 times faster. So from 84 hours that it took our CNN to train on the Pascal Vogue 2007 dataset with a VGG16 backbone, it turns out that faster CNN only took 9.5 hours to train. But more interesting was actually a test time. What happened at test time? So before we mentioned that RCNN takes 47 seconds to process an image, well, it turns out that now we need only 0.32 seconds to process an image with fast RCNN, which is a 146 time increase in speed. So these um, changes actually mean faster training time, much faster test time. 
and it turns out the results are even better. So you can even see that results have improved slightly in, in MAP, which is um, the mean average precision, how you actually measure object detection quality. And it turns out that faster CNN was even better on MAP. Now, um, one important thing though, is that these test times do not include proposal generation. So we have already said that the object proposals are actually taken from a separate method. And then uh, FASTER-CNN does all the computation on top of the object proposals. So the 0 0.32 seconds is once the object proposals have already been extracted. So this test time is not really the time that we will actually spend in processing an image. It turns out that if you do add this, things get much slower. And of course, then instead of having 47 seconds per image, RCNN takes 50 seconds and faster CNN then takes two seconds per image. So only 25 time um, speed increase. So things are still pretty slow, right? I might not want to wait two seconds to actually process an image, but luckily for us, there is an even faster version. What Faster CNN actually proposes is to get rid of the only thing that is making things slow now, which is the object proposal method, right? It makes no sense to have a separate object proposal method that is making things really slow. And the question that was answered in Faster CNN is, can we actually reuse our CNN features and still be able to create these object proposals? So essentially, can we have a region proposal network? Can we integrate this object proposal generation inside the neural network? So the idea is that you can actually train a region proposal network, an RPN, to directly produce these region proposals. And after this RPN, everything is going to be like faster CNN. So your ROI pooling, your classifier, your regression on top. So the question is, how is this region proposal network actually shaped like? So how can we actually design a network to extract object proposals? So let's go back to our penguin image. Uh, we have this feature map, which is now H by W by, let's say, 4096. And I want to extract proposals from this feature map. So first of all, is uh, we need to design on a fixed number of proposals. So we've already discussed that having outputs uh, of not a fixed size is not really a good idea for neural networks. Neural networks really work well, work well for uh, tensors with a fixed size output. So we decide on a fixed number of proposals. And the other question that we need to answer is, where are we actually going to place these proposals? And we decide to actually place them densely, so for each pixel of this uh, feature map. So we're going to zoom in on our feature map. And essentially what happens at every location of our feature map, so again, we have H by W locations in our feature map. Of course, this depends on the input image size and what happens inside our feature extractor, our CNN. But let's assume that we have these H by W locations. So what happens for each location is that we're going to extract, um, we're going to fix first of all, uh, a set of anchors. And by anchors, I actually mean um, the number of proposals that we're going to extract per location. So essentially, I decide that I'm going to extract nine proposals for each of these locations in the H by W feature map. And these are going to be nine anchors with a fixed scale and fixed aspect ratio. So I'm going to have nine anchors because I have three scales that I'm going to use and I have three aspect ratios. So all the combinations of these scales and aspect ratios mean that I have actually these nine anchors. And so for each of these locations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract this descriptor, which is going to be 256 dimensional descriptor. And from this, I'm going to predict, first of all, 
bounding box coordinates. So how much do I actually want to change these anchors to better fit the objects? Right? This, this has a similar intuition as uh, we had before for the bounding box regression, where we had the object proposal, then we regressed the coordinates a little bit to better fit the object. This is exactly the same, but already to determine object proposals. Right? So I have these anchors, which have these fixed scales, these fixed axis ratios. So I need to give it a bit of room to actually move around these anchors. So I do have a regression step, kind of a bounding box refinement or anchor refinement. And I'm also going to predict here two scores for whether uh, that actually judge whether this anchor contains an object or not. So very easy classification problem. Um, again, this happens for every location in the feature map. So this is kind of a zoomed in version of our H by W feature map. And this um, position here indicates one location of this H by W feature map. Now, um, we want to actually um, use this um, a certain architecture to extract one of these descriptors for each of these locations in the feature map. And this descriptor in this, in this particular form is, has this uh, length of 256, but could be anything, right? So it's, the important thing is that it is a descriptor for each location in my feature map. So this is basically how I do it, right? So I'm going to use three by three combs for this. And you can already see um, in the previous slide what um, that it was a three by three comb because you actually have here this three by three filter that is being you know passed through this feature map in a sliding window fashion and when it is centered around this location it actually extracts this 256 descriptor and then has this regression head and classification head uh, remember n are uh, the number of anchors. So he, here we have four by nine coordinates and here we have two by nine scores. So essentially the region proposal network is a three by three convolution. In particular is um, 256 three by three convolutional filters that are acting on top of this H by W by 4096 feature map. And they reduce the depth of this feature map from 4096 to 256. So essentially what this operation is doing is it, it is extracting a 256 descriptor for each of the locations of my H and W feature map. And so now I have decided that I want to have nine anchors for each of these uh, positions in my feature map. So in total, I'm going to have H by W by N, where N is nine, number of anchors per image. And so essentially what I'm going to have as an output is I have to actually transform this 256 descriptor into the output that I'm interested in. And the output that I'm interested in is for each anchor, I want the classification score of object non-object, so two values, and also the bounding box regression, which was four values. So essentially I want to have an output instead of 256, I want to have a 2n plus 4n output. And I can do exactly this operation with convolutions. In particular, they use one by one convolution to simply transform these 256 values into 2n plus 4n. Essentially, since your anchors um, are defined all the same for each of these locations of H by W, then you can easily train this network to interpret these 2n plus 4n values appropriately, which means two values for classification into object and non-object, and four values to actually regress the anchor into the object proposal position. And this um, set of 3 by 3 comps and 1 by 1 comps is actually what constitutes the region proposal network. So it's a very flexible network, just a series of convolutions. 
So again, for each feature map location, so dense extraction, you get a set of, first of all, anchor classification, yes or no for object, non-object, and also um, bounding box regression. Means I take my anchor with the scale and aspect ratio and I correct it slightly to better fit the object if there is one in there. So another question is how do I train my RPA, right? <clears throat> so I do have um, ground truth boxes, right? And the first question is that I need to answer is how do I obtain the classification ground truth? So first of all, I'm going to compute a value that is called P star, which actually indicates how much an anchor overlaps with the ground truth bounding box. Right, so you have your set of anchors, you know where they're placed, you know where your ground truth detections are, so you compute the intersection over union overlap, and if it's higher than 0 0.7, which means there is a fair amount of overlap between anchor and bounding box, then you consider P star to be 1, if it's lower than 0 0.3, so there is really very little overlap or none, then P star is 0. And actually, 1 will indicate that the anchor represents an object, right? So it's foreground, it is, the classification should be 1. And 0 will indicate that it's, the anchor is just on the background. Now, it is important to note that the rest, so whatever falls into intersection over union between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 is actually not considered for training. So for training, we'll only consider the boxes that have an eye of view larger than 0 0.7 with a ground truth box or below 0 0.3 with any bounding box, ground truth bounding box. So now, um, essentially what we do is for each image, we randomly sample 256 anchors, right? We cannot take all of the anchors in the mini batch, so we construct our mini batch by randomly sample, sampling 256 anchors. We form our mini batch. We also make sure that we have balanced um, anchors that contain objects versus anchors that do not contain objects. Then we calculate the classification loss. It's simply a binary cross entropy based on the P star value that we found before. And those anchors that do contain an object are then going to be used to compute the regression loss. Only those anchors that contain an object, because of course you cannot regress any box if there is no object in that box. Now, um, each of the anchors is going to be described, first of all, by the center position and then the width and the height. So this is a slightly different representation um, of the one we're using for boxes where usually X and Y were um, the bottom left corner. In this case, it is the center. And so essentially, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate um, these nine anchors for each of these positions of the feature map. And so once I reach a position in the feature map, this is going to be essentially X a and Y A, and then I'm going to generate my anchor box. And so what the network actually predicts is not directly the coordinates X, A, Y, A, W, A, and H, A, but our um, relative values with respect um, to the center, the width and height of the anchor. So essentially what we're going to break are these four values which you can interpret as basically normalized x-coordinate, so how much shift with respect to the actual center of the anchor do I need to have to have a better fitting bounding box. Same thing for the y-axis, same thing for the width and the height. So this is just to have an easier time. So neural network is going to have an easier time if it has to predict relative values with respect to, for example, a center of a bounding box, rather than if it has to predict the full size of the bounding box. And actually, um, this is the representation that is going to be used in many networks later on. So it's, it's a representation that the faster CNN authors came up with, the normalized X, normalized Y, uh, normalized width and height. And what they actually used to train this neural network was a smooth L1 loss on these regression targets. So um, 
training at first uh, was not really easy. So they also had a, quite a complex training scheme and especially separate training scheme for each of the parts of the faster CNN architecture. Um, nowadays, we can actually train this jointly by having all these um, heads with, with the different losses balanced and, and trained all together at the same time. But in the paper, you will see this separate training, where first you actually train the RPN for classification, so to classify into object, non-object. Then you train the RPN regression to go from this anchor coordinates to the object proposal coordinates. Then you train the fast RCNN type of classification, so the actual semantic um, information into types of objects. And finally, you would train the fast RCNN regression which goes from object proposal to the final bounding box. So it turns out that uh, faster CNN is much faster than faster CNN. It's 10 times faster at test time, to be precise. You can also actually train it end to end, including feature extraction step, region proposal extraction, classification and regression. And of course, this means that it can be actually more accurate because you can actually use the information of the, of the object detection task to even improve proposals. And it is important to note again that the RPN is fully convolutional. So, so it's a really flexible architecture. And just to have a kind of, a, of an idea of the speed and the um, the actual accuracies for um, the RCNN family members. Remember, we started with a test time per image, including proposals of 50 seconds. And now with faster CNN, we went down to 0.2 seconds, so much, much faster, in particular, 250 times faster. And MIP did not change from faster CNN to faster CNN, so we still get these uh, very, very accurate results. This concludes the lecture on two-stage object detectors, uh, very accurate um, methods. And the question for the next lecture will be, do we actually need to separate the detection process into this object proposal extraction and further classification? Or can we do this in a single stage? So stay tuned for the one-stage object detection lecture, which will happen next week. See you then.